two of our move from Durkheimian sociology, as depicted in Irving Goffman, um, through Mark, uh, to Marx through Hegel, and we're going to spend this uh, video looking at um, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, and we're going to look particularly at the famous section on the master-slave dialectic. Um, you know, it's actually uh, in, uh, you know, technically, I've got, I've got the Miller translation here. Um, you know, it's actually technically the uh, lordship and bondage section, uh, but, you know, it's historically been, um, you know, known as the master-slave dialectic. So we'll just leave it, uh, leave that language there. So um, it's hard to actually make space for Hegel in an undergraduate sociological theory course. Um, it, there's just too much to get done. But I think that some familiarity with at least the language of Hegel and some sort of you know, loose and, and um, sketchy and, you know, almost comic book, um, a walk through um, uh, the phenomenology seems worthwhile, or at least that narrow section that we're looking at here. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is, um, um, I, 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 I tell you what, why, why don't I just give you sort of a, a, a foreshadow of where we're headed here? Okay, so we're going to look through the uh, uh, dialectic of master and slave. Um, the, the main thing that we're going to argue is that value, society, the moral order, social cells, persons, all the things we've been sort of looking at so far, the stuff of sociology, the ontological structure of society, right? All of this comes into existence through um, what we're going to call a submission at the end of, uh, of a struggle to the death. And I think this is one of Hegel's great um, uh, insights is that in this sort of prehistory of any society is a death struggle and that um, differences of power and uh, of, 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 of willingness to kill um, and a kind of difference of willingness to survive in exchange for service, right, um, predates any society. So, so, so this is what we're going to look at is that, at, is that in a struggle to the death that is fought to the end, at the very end, uh, those who are willing to submit rather than die uh, become the first uh, givers of deference uh, that essentially energizes, generates, honors, respects, uh, values, and then creates the kind of moral order um, around the worship of values, or the in, 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 which are generally born in in the first instance um, by a master. In other words, a, uh, something like bondsmen or slave or subordinates in an economic and social system come into existence through a death struggle, okay? And that, uh, and that the master is a sort of the, the, the victor, uh, the, the slave is the vanquished, um, and uh, again, the moral order is generated through this dialectic back and forth between victor and vanquished, right? Mutual recognition takes place and so on. Okay, so then we're going to talk about that. So this generates a social system of mutual recognition that we know of as the spirit or, or society. We're going to distinguish between recognition, a kind of psychological or mutual recognition, and the performance of services and work and production. Really important. We're going to talk about the dialectical contradictions that emerge in the master-slave uh, relationship. It's an unstable thing. It can't help but progress. And we're going to talk about how that is going to work out. Um, and I think we can get to the rest of that um, as we work our way through it. Okay, so... Um, I think the best place to begin, again, is with um, mirrors. And um, actually, let's, let's start with this one. So um, again, mirrors are weird things. And many sociologists and psychoanalysts and others have spent quite a bit of time sort of reflecting on mirrors. Um, and, you know, mirrors appear everywhere in um, Western art. And in um, you know depictions of vanity, so the vain are often depicted as people who are uh, sort of in love with their own mere reflection, that kind of thing here. Um, and so here we have someone getting a kind of virtual self <laughs> in uh, the the examination of the mirror. But really, in the end, this isn't a mutual recognition because it's an actual mirror. Our big argument here is going to be as follows: that for most of human um, uh, history, I suppose, in prehistory, um, most human beings haven't actually had mirrors. And most of us have only been able to know who and what we are by looking into the reflective surface of another person's face. 
for most of us, the mother er or mother ers um, was our source of um, of a sense of self. So uh, you know, as I did in the last video, mirrors are weird things. When you look at a bloody mirror, you can kind of see yourself there. And that's actually what a mother does. A mother essentially provides for an infant uh, a mirror surface where they can see whether they're good or bad or um, uh, smart or athletic or, um, you know, bad or, you know, a, a cookie stealing monster or whatever. Right. So so so, you know, the, the mother's face and reactions is the mirror service. So so the mother doesn't just feed the child milk. The mother feeds the child a sense of self through the responses to the child's conduct. And as the child begins to vaunt different cells and try different uh, behaviors and so on, that they're molded and shaped and, and, and pulled together a kind of coherent sense of self through the, the mothering um, a process. So, so here I've got, you know, again, there, here's the, the, the famous uh, image of Eve in, um, in the garden. And, uh, you know, good old Satan in the form of a snake is providing a kind of mirror image. It's all you have to do here to get Eve to partake of the apple is to show her this uh, image of herself and, and her vanity uh, will take over uh, from there. Well, in, again, in sociology and in social psychology and psychoanalysis, uh, mirrors often appear. Uh, you know, th this is so, so in, in um, Charles Horton Cooley. Uh, famously in the book Human Nature and the Social Order, I think written in 1901, um, really worked out the concept of the looking glass self, which is kind of a layman's version or a kind of um, um, a somewhat um, um, less sophisticated version of the process of mutual recognition that Hegel develops in his book. So, so really fast. What Hegel argues is that the, the child, through interaction with the mother-er and then other caregivers, develops a looking glass self. The self as reflected off of the responses of the other intimate people in their life provides a kind of rough sketch of the ego or the I, and that that becomes the thing then that, that moves out into the world. So, so, uh, so yeah. So Cooley's great uh, line was, I am who I think others think I am, right? Uh, and, and so this is a very Americanized version that, um, that, that I as a self have the capacity to edit the image that comes to me off of other people's responses to me. So it's kind of a very American a way of thinking about mutual recognition and self-consciousness as generated through the reflection of other people's responses to us. I like Jacques Lacan's view much better. In his mirror stage, Lacan basically argues that I am who others think I am, full stop, right? That there is very little of a kind of interactive self-definition. I think Goffman makes the same argument in the last instance, the self that we are is something that has to be projected onto us from others, that we actually, in his first book, The Presentation of Self, seems to present so much uh, a power uh, to actors, gives them a lot of power to define themselves. But his later work is really much more um, structural, a symbolic order. So like Jacques Lacan and others, you know, you, you, you have a self that's, that's essentially the social birth of the human individual uh, places you inside of a social order and the self that you have is largely predetermined for you by your parents and others. So, so, so it, let, let's set all of that aside. The big idea is, is that we become a self through the reflection of other people looking at us. And for most of humans, for most humans in, in history, it's been the mother er, and then the immediate group of people around us that is generated for us the idea of who we are. So we can't see our own face. Um, again, mirrors are a very late development in, 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 in Homo sapien uh, existence. So the only way we know what we are um, you know, uh, is looking at other people's responses to us. So we adapt ourselves to other people's responses and so on. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So let's, so how does that work out? So in, in, um, in Hegel's dialectic of master and slave, he's going to be doing just like we talked about, um, self-generation and Goffman. And just like we talked about it a minute ago with, uh, uh the mirroring process. So, um, so basically, the idea is, is that each of us, when we come into the co-presence, even if we imagine the co-presence of another 
other of an other right an other we ask ourselves the fundamental question what am i to the other or the great way that it's phrased um, in in much of lacan and sure the way that jezik certainly phrases is what does the other want of me okay what do they want and the answer to that question is me the self so that what that means is is that the desire of the other so i look at this other and i get from them a mere reflection of what they want of me so i will say uh thing one here let's make that thing one thing one um is defined as a mirror reflection of thing two. What does thing two want of thing one? That's what thing one is for the practical purpose of the interaction with thing two, right? Thing two the same way. So thing two takes a look at thing one, asks the question, what does thing one want of me? And the answer to that question, reflected off of the desire of thing one, is what thing two is for the for the moment, right? In other words, each of them are a mirror to the other, and the self that each of them is, is something that is reflected off of the response of the other. When am I to that other? Am I an enemy? Then by God, I'm an enemy and I'm gonna fight, right? What am I to the other? Am I an object of desire? Do they love me in some way? Well, then I'll respond in that way, right? Um, you know, what is that other to me, right? Okay, so the self is something that is generated in a reflection off of someone else, right? So it's this process then of mutual recognition. So when bodies and sort of uh, existential selves are interacting, um, their, their interaction is actually guided by this mental process where each is imagining what they are uh, to the other. So I am what the other desires of me, or at least I am defined by the other person's desire and that other is defined by my desire, right? So you get this, this strange play of the desire. So it is the desire of the other generates a double of me, almost like a soul, okay? So we know that, 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 um, um, that the soul is this immaterial thing that animates us, right? In most uh, religious um, theologies. And to Lacan and to Hegel and to others, the... Um, the thing, that immaterial thing that animates us is the, is the self that results from the desire of the other. So if some other wants to fight, right, you're defined by that desire, right? And then you become the spirit of that other person's desire and you animate yourself um, at, um, in, in, in a way that's fitting to it. Okay, now that's a little silly. Let's go to the full-blown uh, um, image here. So um yeah so in in hegel the um yeah uh, and so so in hegel um again it is it is the desire of an other that determines the self so it is uh so here it is so what am so here's again thing one and thing two uh thing one has a desire and the desire of the other is bounced back and becomes thing two's self-definition. So what is thing two? And at least in the situational moment we're dealing with here, thing two is defined by thing one's desire. And similarly, thing one is, is defined by thing two's desire. So whatever I am to that other, whatever that other wants of me, negates me i might well as well not have any other existence for the moment because i am now defined by that other person's desire that other thing's desire okay so when am i to this other is the fundamental question that then determines my self-consciousness so other people then are screens onto which my desire is projected and uh they can so so i'm a screen onto which my desire is reflected back and the other person can to see who they are and and vice versa so that image is the basic image of sort of hegelian mutual recognition and it's reflected in lacan it's reflected in charles Warren cooley it's actually present to a degree in george herbert mead and, and there's a whole bunch of social theorists and a whole bunch of social 
uh, psychology is explained right here uh, in that. Okay, so um, so how does this play out then? Okay, so in in um, so this is then in the dialectic of lord and bondsman, uh, in master and slave. We really are going to look at five stages. Okay, five stages. Stage one. Um, the we have two beings that are essentially contained within themselves, animalistic. Um, I, I actually, you, you know, th this can be an individual. It can be a, a, a social entity like a horde or a, a group, a society even, that's self-referential, that is essentially living um, um, in accordance with something like drives. Um, all right, so each is a being of drive. So what does that mean? That means like the drive, the sex drive, the hunger drive, the organic drives of the body determine the conduct and the activity of that self. So you have a being not of desire, you have a being of drive. And so that means that you kind of have a, a self that's engaged in the rotary motion of reproduction. And, that, and so, so when one of those societies, with thing one again, or persons, comes into contact with another, thing two, each of which believe themselves to be absolute, um, they sort of stop engaging in drive behavior, and they instead want to know what the other wants of them, right? What do they want of me? The answer to that, uh, so each of these animalistic beings, we'll just leave it there. It's not quite right, but we'll just leave it. These biologically determined beings or sort of at least um, um, species being determined beings, we'll put it that way. Um, they believe themselves to be absolute. Then they become aware of the other. And that other, that other, right, becomes, uh, ignites uh, desire. So they become, they get a spirit, they get a definition, they get a self-consciousness they become conscious of self as a response or as defined by the other's desires. The desire of the other generates self-consciousness, okay? Well, there's another there, and I'm suddenly aware of myself. What is that other one of me that's going to define uh, what I am, right? So it ignites desire in each of the parties. Because each of these beings believes themselves to be an absolute, right? That's not determined, that's not limited by any other um, they don't really care very much about what the other's desire is. They don't care. They just want that other's desire to go away. So it tends to lead to a struggle to the death. And so that's what this is. This is the death struggle. If both die, the self-consciousness each had, as defined by the other's desire, dies too. If one vanquishes the other, spirit is, dies as well. In other words, self-consciousness or spirit, this immaterial thing that animated conduct related to another being, um, social being, um, dies because you have killed off the bearer of desire. The other is dead. Therefore, my consciousness, as defined by the other's desire, is dead as well. Okay? So spirit doesn't exist then. Spirit, or something like an ongoing self, person, um, as defined in a kind of difference in demeanor ritual, only comes into existence in this scenario, which we'll call stage three here, in which at the last instant, the vanquished says, look, don't kill me. Um, I will submit and serve you in exchange for life. And so I will give up honor because honor, the Valhalla, right, to wind up in Valhalla, you would have had to have died in battle with honor. So I'm going to give up honor in that sense. I'm going to give up value in that sense. Um, and, and I'm now going to, I'm, I'm not going to fall. I've fallen, but I've not fallen all the way. And because I didn't fall all, all the way, I can't go to Valhalla. I can't be part of the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the heroes, right? The hall of heroes or something. Instead, I'm now a slave, a person without uh, honor. So, um, so the master conquers or dies, and the slave submits to live. So the vanquished becomes slave. The master becomes um, uh, the you know the, the being that dominates. So, um, so let's let's emphasize something here. So now we now have that situation of mutual recognition, so that we talked about before, where um, 
Yeah, so this is slave, this is the master. Okay, so um, so just like in the deference and de demeanor rituals in Goffman, we now have one being who is deferring to, which means you are ritualistically signaling, ceremonially signaling de deference that you are inferior to uh, an other, that an other determines who you are, that you are limited by, determined by, structured by the desires of another. So I'm not a being in and to myself. I, slave, who have been vanquished, am now um, defined by the desire of this other. Okay, so then the master then becomes the being of demeanor who receives the deference of the other and becomes the thing that is, um, that is, that enjoys, as we're going to talk about in just a minute, that enjoys the status of the master. Okay, so there's a psychological and or, or spiritual uh, uh, dimension to the mutual recognition. And that is simply, I am going to signal to you, master, that I am your slave and that you have defeated me and vanquished me. And I'm going to do that through these ceremonial displays of deference. Okay, so I'm going to project deference and you, master, will receive it with demeanor. Okay, so now I have the status of slave. I'm now defined by that status. And that means I am now defined by the master's desire, right? The desire of the master becomes my, that's who I am. And this, so that defines the slave. And the master is defined now by the being who enjoys. I enjoy this other who serves me, right? I dominate them. So I'm now not a being who spins and does my own stuff, the master. I am now the being who is defined by my desires as met by the slave, okay? So, so you get this mutual uh, recognition goes on. So part one is that, is that ceremonial display. And then part two is the material side of it. That there's an actual service that is performed by the slave um, and the production of things that meet the enjoyment, the desire of the master. So the master desires the subordination, the projection of deference, right? And that's what they desire. And they also enjoy the labor and the production and service of the other, okay? So that's what we have depicted here. So this is stage four. So after the struggle to the death, the death struggle that led to, you know, almost the vanquishing, the final killing of the, um, of, 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 of the slave, we now have the slave becoming the being who serves, the being who gives deference, the being who is defined by the desire of the master for deference and by the enjoyment of, of the labor of the slave, right? So that, that defines me, the master's job. I'm the being that, that serves the master for enjoyment. And then the master then is defined as the being who receives and enjoys um, and, you know, uh, and controls the... Um, the slave. So again, if we can go back to that sort of that, that phase one, um, social life prior to spirit was a world of something like self-containment and, and, and the meeting of drives through one's own activity. But by, that, by the time you get here, after the struggle to the death, we're now in a fully social world, a world of persons, a world of ritual, a world of values, because the, this is now a value right? This, uh, the slave has now essentially been suspended. They're kind of undead. They didn't fall and they're now living. And so this master now has value that they don't, their life is possessed by the master. And so feeding, tending, serving that master, worshiping that master, bending, right? And so on. That becomes this, the, 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 the slave's morality. So the slave is then defined as the being who meets the master's desire and who helps the master enjoy. And the uh, master then is the thing that enjoys and dictates and determines the slave's conduct. So uh, again, I grew up Roman Catholic. It's always astonishing to me to hear that kind of language in Roman Catholicism, this sort of that the, the ethic of the servant, the ethic of a kind, you know, Nietzsche called it a slave morality, right? This idea that a good person obeys, serves the Lord, bows down before the Lord, is determined by the Lord, doesn't determine oneself, but is determined by the Lord, that kind of thing, right? Well, that's, that's essentially um, this dialectical definition process, mutual recognition, worked out. 
God in, in, in Christian morality will recognize me if I serve, uh, serve him. So this is um, really faster. This is an image from um, my childhood. My grandmother had this image on her wall. It's an image of Christ the King. And if you know anything about your Bible, you know that, that, that Jesus of Nazareth was far from an aristocratic uh, you know, um, a person who has a crown and a uh, scepter, right? And wore fancy garments like that um, and had that really neatly trimmed beard. Um, coronavirus hair, but not uh, the thing. But, but we know that Jesus of Nazareth was a relatively poor uh, a person who, um, who, who wasn't you know, loaded with, with material wealth. And yet, in the iconography of uh, aristocratic um, uh, medieval Catholicism, Jesus often took on the appearance of being a master. So that's what we have here. Jesus is a master. God is master. And if you, you shall serve the Lord, right? You shall do the Lord's bidding. So yeah, th so this is the image of Christ the King, which is pretty widespread. So to be a good um, religious person in a world like this then is to be a person who, again, lives in accordance with the commands of the Lord, right? And then you obey uh, from there. Well, that's what we have here. This idea of uh, that you are defined by the desire and by the commands of the Lord, and the Lord enjoys the worship and the service of, um, of the um, of the, of the vanquished, of the slave in this sense. Okay, in stage five, then, uh, well, we, so, so here's what happens. We have that, we have this, this kind of, um, we have a contradiction going on here. So on the one hand, the master desires the deference of the slave. On the other hand, they enjoy the material production, service and production of the, uh, of the slave as well. So what that means is, is that over time, as the uh, as the master lounges about enjoying the slave's labor, the slave becomes the master of the master. In other words, the master loses the capacity to be self-determining. They absolutely, in order to be master, have to have the deference of the slave. And so you wind up in this situation where after a time, all of the material needs of the master can only be met by the slave and the slave's um, deference is the only thing that allows this sort of insecure and weak uh, master uh, to have any kind of, of, um, of, of self, right? And so the slave becomes stronger and stronger and stronger as they're literally carrying the master. And by slave, we really mean here the society that's built up to serve the aristocratic or, or, or lord's needs, right? And that at some point, the slave becomes aware of um, of their that 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 the material labor is completely being done by them, and that the service is completely being done by them, and that they really don't need the master at all, and that they stop giving psychological uh, recognition to the master, and often um, enslave the masters. So you get something like a dialectical inversion. You get a essentially a revolution. Okay, so at the point when the slave class or slave caste or the society that's grown up to meet the master class's needs grows strong enough, they recognize that they can throw off the master and they don't need it all, and that's the negation. So the point is, is that this whole process of master-slave mutual recognition is one that is self-negating, right? It will not last. It has a kind of a negation, self-negation built into it. Okay, so in other words, what's going to happen over time is that, uh, is that, is that these master-slave systems are unstable and that you're going to have revolution. And, you know, people are going to knife the king and kill the king off, and then you're going to have, you know, again, any Shakespeare uh, will do it to you. Eventually, a master-slave system uh, will eventually evolve. It'll reach not just, you won't just have that churning of the king, but you're going to have an evolution of the system so that the kind of total abject deference, prostration of the slave is, um, um, is altered so that the absolute difference between the master and the slave is lessened a bit. So you wind up with something like medieval feudalism. Um, there's more uh, modes of production than this, but we'll just use that where you get the lord and serpent feudalism. 
um, where the relative differences are less, where the lords are now constrained by custom, where the serfs have something like rights, they have something like um, like legal systems and courts and so on, where they can actually hold the master accountable. And, and, so, and so you have relative social equality. You're beginning to become more equal. So the recognition, the deference is less, right? So I've got, I, instead of laying on one's stomach, I've got sort of just that bowing down. Then Marx going to tell us we eventually get to uh, capitalism, which is a world of formal legality. So technically, no matter how wealthy someone is, we should be able to uh, to stand on our own hind legs and refuse to bow before them. So, you know, so, so there's a kind of social esteem, a quality of esteem, a quality of rights that goes along uh, with capitalism le legally anyway, even though there's great differences in, in wealth. Technically, the if, the if the rule of law continues to hold, which is questionable, um, you know, money will not force other people into submission. But, 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 but again, workers have rights and we all have the legal status of citizens, those kinds of things that come with the basket of rights. Again, this is all questionable going forward. But at any rate, so, so that's the basic story. So the question is, why is it so, so you get this, it's self-negating. So Hegel, Hegel's work is always about, about negation. So in Hegel's world, um, um, the master-slave dialectic and almost any of Hegel's books um, depict a process of 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 heaven, um, which means canceling up or negating while preserving. I think it's probably the best way to put it. In other words, dialectical reasoning in Hegel and in Marx, and really in most of the social theorists who look at this semester that are grounded in in, in Hegel and Marx, um, progression occurs through negation. What, what that means is, is that there are contradictions in a system, and the way that a system proceeds is by negating some element that cancels it up, right? And then preserves some elements of the system while, uh, while altering it by getting rid of others, okay? So how does this work? Well, so what that means is the memory and content of the past is preserved in the present. The memory and content of the past is preserved in the present. This is the way human beings grow up. All, any of us who were a child know that the memory of the past is preserved in the present, even as a fully adult person. There's like an inner child in there somewhere, that kind of thing. All right. So, in, so, in, uh, so I'm going to have a couple of examples here to sort of show dialectical reason. Um, in, in, in America, uh, road signs don't work this way, but in Germany they do. In Germany, um, basically there's a kind of default speed that, that, in, that when, when, when not limited in any other way, there's a default. You know, let's say it's 120 kilometers per hour. When you come to a town, there will often be a speed limit sign that will be present at the entry to the town. You'll drop it down to 50 kilometers per hour, about 30 miles an hour. You'll get through town. And then as you leave the town, right, you're going to get an, another sign. And the sign is going to have 50 with a slash mark. So what that means is, in, in America, you wouldn't have that, right? You'd have just like a, a new speed limit sign saying 65 miles an hour or whatever. But in Germany, you don't. So, so, so here you have a reduced speed. And then when you get through town, you have a negation of the reduced speed. So it's 50 negated by, and, and, and then 50 negated. So it means you go back to the default. So there's kind of an interesting thing. So that means when you get to the end of town, you, you, get, you, you actually know not just that you're able to go at different speed, but you preserve the memory, the content of the slowdown that you just experienced. So you know you were supposed to be going 50, and now you're free to go uh, uh, unlimited again. In German parking, and you often see that like, like, like uh, parking and no parking will be set up this way. And I, I was once at a hotel in Germany where uh, the normal parking in front of the hotel, uh, there was simply a, a piece of tape put over the sign that's indicated no parking for the duration of the construction that was underway. But um, what that meant is that you knew that normally you could park there, it's just for the moment you couldn't, right? So it preserved the um, memory, the content of the parking that used to be there um, with that, with that uh, uh, so, so you negate while preserving, okay? So that's the way that you progress in a dialectical system. You Pre, you you negate while preserving. Okay, financial accounting I was an accountant for a time. Um, in accounting, um, you don't just record a bill 
and then when it's paid, you cancel it out. Well, yeah, you do actually. Yes, that is that's the point. Yeah, that's actually the point, right? Is that yes, that at the end of the year, um, you not only have the accounts. This is what tells you how much you have paid in the course of a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you negate the bill when it's paid, and then you have a record that the bill was still there. So you're negating that you have a bill, but you're preserving the memory and the content of what was in the mark that negates. So an American, a uh, foolish American, for example, you might have someone owes you $100. When they pay you, you just simply rip it up, or rip up the, the IOU and it's gone, or you erase it and it's gone. And here you're negating the account while preserving um, the memory of it. Okay, I think that'll work. Um, here's fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables, you negate the living thing, but you find a way to cancel out the life that's in the fruit in a way that preserves the good stuff. You're preserving its essence, essence in, in, in applesauce or something. And then we go again in that each of the systems, uh, the great systems of domination uh, that, that are essentially modes of production, and we don't have them all written down here, but the, some of the big ones, um, as the system progresses, it, it's progressed in a way that preserves what was. So in the master-slave system, again, as it evolves, you get preserved. Um, uh, it's negated in a way that cancels it up into feudalism, again, where there's less econ relative legal and social equality. Uh, you can have great economic inequality, but you have relative legal equality relative to slavery. And then again, in capitalism, you've got legal equality, uh, where again, the, the legal differences between capitalist and worker are zero supposedly. Um, whereas here you really had a separate legal system and here you only had a legal system for the master. The slave had no rights at all, right? Okay. So, so in a dialectical system, you progress through negation. You progress through negation. And so revolution is bound to happen as the master comes into possession of, of, uh, of a, um, of awareness of, of, um, of, as the slave comes into awareness of the master's power. As the slave comes into awareness of the master's weakness. I'm going to leave it at that and um, we'll pick this up uh, next time. I hope you found this at least somewhat useful.